So just for your kind information, the meeting has begun and I've started recording. So I hope you all don't mind that. Most, moreover, welcome to our Explore ML session that's in collaboration with the student ambassadors at ITR, like the Microsoft Student Ambassadors at ITR, along with the GDSC ITR. So today is day one, and we will begin with ML Basics. And just to give you a brief introduction about the speaker and the organizers, well, we have an amazing speaker with us today evening, and that's Abel. He's out here. He's an Explore ML facilitator, and do not worry. You're going to be in the right hands for the next two days, and I hope that each of you who have joined us this evening will make the most out of this event. Now to throw a bit more light on the organizers. Um, hi there, this is Ankita. I'll be your host for the day just to tell you about a few ground rules. If you have any queries, feel free to show them out in the chat box, and I'll make sure that your queries are addressed. Apart from that, the other organizer of this event is Mr. Pravesh Ghosh, your GDSC lead, as well as another Microsoft Student Learn Ambassador from ITR. So that would be almost it about the introduction. Without any further ado, I'd request Abel to take up the podium, and we think it's a good point to begin with. I'll take my presentation down. Oops, my apologies. I probably never shared my screen. But not wasting any more time. Maybe I can quickly take you through the screen. So with this, we begin. And Abdul, I hope you can take over now. Thank you so much, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi, Gita. Hi, Parish. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. I assume I am audible. If not, then. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Yes. Can you see my screen, which I suppose should work? That it's, it's a yes or a no. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Oh, perfect. It's a 100% yes. We can see the screen and you're good to go. OK, awesome, awesome. Hello, hi, everyone. Good evening. I am Abel Matthew. I am. Well, yeah, as Ankit already said, I am an Explore ML facilitator. I was a former DS elite um, two and a half years ago, almost from 2019 to 2020. If the volume of my speech is not good enough, do stop me in between. Uh, I am an Explore ML facilitator. I have facilitated this workshop a um, few weeks ago, and also I have taken this work the same workshop in person at my university in the year 2019. So this is a workshop that is always fun to take. And uh, I look forward to a fun interactive session with you all. And um, well, yeah, what about uh, uh, we start off by if some of you could at least speak saying what is your experience with ML? What do you know so that I could frame my examples, play the session alongside it? This session is an extremely beginner friendly session. This session is introduction to machine learning. This assumes that you have got no prior knowledge about machine learning, so it is completely for beginners. This is uh, two. Uh, it's a two-part series. Uh, it's a collaboration between Google's AI team and Google's crowdsource team. Um, the first part deals with introduction to machine learning. The second part deals with introduction to neural networks. Together, these two workshops are known as the beginners track for machine learning by Google crowdsource. Um, the attendees of the workshop who attend both the workshops do receive a certificate from Explore ML. The entire process is an automated process, so uh, I'll be quickly sending a form that you all can fill, uh, which would... Uh, there are two forms that you have to fill. The first is a form that you fill in the beginning of the workshop, which is today, and if you attend the second workshop also, which would happen sometime soon, and you fill the post workshop survey as well. Then there's an automated process from Google's and based on the time of the workshop, based on time you fill and all those stuffs that will generate certificate of participation to everyone who attended. So that's how it works. So I'll just quickly put it in the chat. Give me just a second. So chat I, might not be available to some of us. 
interest like who so, joined as guest hmm. interesting so do you or anyone have an idea i'll take care of that um you can add that in the chat and i'll make sure every single participant out here receives it later on via email as well not an issue um, um, um uh, let me make it easier for you so this is the form i'll make it easier for you right now because i don't want people to miss out filling it because i'm not sure of what the process is from google side because i don't know if they track the time or stuff because very frankly the last time i took the workshop it worked perfectly for anyone i don't want to take chances because if people attend the workshop and then they are not able to get the certificate then it will be sad on everyone's part so i'm not sure how it works uh, on google side because as i said earlier it's an automated process Let's just assume that this works. Incognito tab. I suppose my screen is still still visible. Yes. Okay. So this is the pre-workshop survey. Yeah, it's a pretty simple one. You have to put your mail ID. Uh, there will also be a post-workshop survey. Make sure you put the same mail ID. Uh, this will also be the mail ID in which you get the certificate once it is generated. Um, then all of this is simple. Um, the name of the facilitator. Give me a second. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, my name is Abel Matthew. So the question to who, who is the facilitator, you will have to answer that. Uh, if there are multiple facilitators, no, that I am the only facilitator for the workshop today. The track you are attending is the beginners track. Uh, the remaining questions you can answer as per your convenience, uh, depending on what you find is best. Uh, crowdsource. So this program. Okay, I saw that there was my screen is taken down. If I'm not wrong, my screen is not taken down. Good. Huh. Uh, this is a program from crowdsource. If uh, a lot of things that I am showcasing today will require the crowdsource app. So if you do not have the crowdsource app, you can download it at uh, at uh, this link. Is the link visible well and good? Bada hai, or should I just? It's crowdsource. dot app. dot slash nine. Yes, it is yeah. visible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's the crowdsource app. You can install it, uh, and uh, if you are already using it, you can mention the level over here, and then that's that's about it. Um, the important stuff is the filling the form. This is the form. Um, This is the link for the form. If I increase the font size so that all of you can see, I suppose I suppose folks can find the link. And this is the link to download the. I'll give it few seconds. Um, kindly fill this up. The uh, meantime, if anyone wants to introduce themselves, say something. I'll wait. Will they for a minutes? Shall I begin? Anyone any queries or anything about the form or something? Or are we good to go? I believe we are good to go. Okay, awesome, awesome. So let us begin the part. So let us start again. Suppose my screen is back up again. I suppose you see slide two. 
Yes. Okay. Awesome. So, hello, hi. I'm Abel Matthew. As I have already introduced myself, if I'm not wrong, only two to three times. Um, yeah, I won't introduce myself anymore. Uh, if you want to reach out to me at any point anywhere, you can use that user name. I use that username in almost all the platforms. If you don't find me on that username on a platform, it means I don't exist on the platform. So you can reach me on some other platform. So that's about it from me. So Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, you name it. I have the same username almost everywhere. And uh, well, yeah, if you want to connect, you can connect at um, any of the places that you want. Uh, if you have any doubts after the session, you can reach out to me or anyone, Ankita or anyone. So you're more than happy to answer your questions or point you in the right direction. So let's begin. Uh, I just wanted to make sure one thing. This presentation has got audio, and I'm not sure if I. Let us know. Can some of you confirm if you can hear the audio? Yes, probably through my London chair. I meant audio from the presentation. My apologies, the audio from the presentation isn't audible. So if I do it once again, okay, it should work. What about now? Our ability to learn and get better at tasks yes. through. We can hear you. We can hear the audio, hear the audio. from the presentation. Yes, from the awesome. presentation. Perfect. Thanks for all the test helping. Let's continue. Our ability to learn and get better at tasks through experience is part of being human. When we're born, we know almost nothing and can do almost nothing for ourselves. But soon we're learning and becoming more capable every day. But did you know that computers can do the same? Machine learning brings together statistics and computer science to enable computers to learn how to do a given task without being programmed to do so. Just as your brain uses experience to improve at a task, so can computers. Say you need a computer that can tell the difference between a picture of a dog and a picture of a cat. You could begin by feeding it images and telling it, this one's a dog, that one's a cat. A computer program to learn will seek statistical patterns within the data that will enable it to recognise a cat or a dog in the future. It might figure out on its own that cats have shorter noses and that dogs come in a larger variety of sizes, and then represent that information numerically, organising it in space. But, crucially, it's the computer, not the programmer, that identifies those patterns and establishes the algorithm by which future data will be sorted. One example of a simple yet highly effective algorithm is to find the optimal line separating cats from dogs. When the computer sees a new picture, it checks which side of the line it falls on and then says either cat or dog. But of course, there can be mistakes. The more data the computer receives, the more finely tuned its algorithm becomes and the more accurate it can be in its predictions. Machine learning is already widely applied. It's the technology behind facial recognition, text and speech recognition, spam filters on your inbox, online shopping or viewing recommendations, credit card fraud detection and so much more. At the University of Oxford, machine learning researchers are combining statistics and computer science to build algorithms that can solve more complex problems more efficiently using less computing power. From medical diagnoses to social media, the potential of machine learning to transform our world is truly mind-blowing. To find out more about machine learning, visit oxfordsparks.ox.ac.uk, follow us on Twitter and find us on Facebook. As I already said before, I want this session to be as interactive as possible. So this is a video from Oxford Sparks. It's on YouTube as well. So this is one of the videos that is used to introduce machine learning in almost all the sessions. Um, so after the session, what do you think? What is machine learning in your aspects? Like how, what is machine learning? What is so unique about it? And how does it all matter? Anyone wants to take a guess at it or you want to? Um, maybe like uh, yeah. we don't have to specify the patterns. The computer will do it for us. Like we'll find the patterns and find the solution to a problem for us. We don't have to hard code it. Okay, okay, very right answer. So it's 
computer will find a pattern. We don't have to hard code. All of them are very correct answer. Yes, you are on the right track. Machine learning, yes, you are on the right track. Yes, machine learning is a specific field of AI where systems learn to find patterns and examples in order to make predictions. The aspects that you have to remember is uh, its patterns and examples which drive machine learning. Computer learning how to do a task without explicitly being programmed to do so is what machine learning is. Both of them are points which you covered very well. So right on point. So if you have the CrowdSource app installed from the link I told or can open it. The CrowdSource app is available only on. It is working machines. Yeah, tell me, tell me. Yes, please. Okay, I'll continue. So um, Hello. for folk. Yeah, tell me. Yes. Hello. Yes. Is it is using machines? Yes, yes, you are right. You want to tell something more? Okay, I'll continue. Thanks for your answer. So if you are on the crowdsource app, uh, you can download it and the crowdsource Smart camera task. Uh, a lot of the tasks in CrowdSource app is based directly on machine learning. Uh, if you open the CrowdSource app, the CrowdSource app is available only on Play Store. There is no app presently available on the App Store or the Apple Store. Uh, it's a work in progress. So just in case you do not have a phone which has Play Store, then you would have to wait. Uh, some of the tasks of CrowdSource are available on the web. But things like the smart camera app are not available on the web. It's available only on the mobile app. And the mobile app at the moment is only on Play Store. So if you take a look at the crowdsource smart camera task app, uh, you could see that you could point it at any real image. You don't have to actually click uh, also. It would start recognizing the boundaries of it. And then it's possible that it could tell you exactly what that image is all about. So this works under the hood using various forms of machine learning. So it could recognize things like a bottle, table, pot, fan, bulb, a lot of things. So you, you can give it a try right now. You can give it a try back at home. You can give it a try anytime you want. You would see that in many cases it's able to recognize the object and in some cases it's not able to recognize. You should give it a shot. What are the things it's able to recognize? What are the things it's not able to recognize? And Try to find out a reason. Try to reason with yourself. Uh, why is it it is able to recognize in some cases and why it is not able to recognize in some other cases? The question. I am going to mute yourself. It's not important. Yeah. Uh, the question that comes to a mind that should come to a mind while using the smart camera app on Google CrowdSource app is how does the image identification work? How is it recognizing the objects? And finally, how could we program this? So if anyone has tried the smart camera app and you want to answer these questions, feel free to or else we'll try to answer these questions as we progress through the workshop. Anyone wants to give it a shot? It yeah. is recognizing uh, objects by identifying some specific characteristics of the object like uh, its edges, its color, etc. Mm -hmm. So, so, so given that it is able to identify the edges and everything, like how does it know? Okay, yeah, this form of thing is supposed to be this object. So, is there some database or something? So how do you think it works? So, will this work only for limited set of data that it is already trained on, or will it work for anything? What is the more, uh, I think the more data we feed and the more we try to train it, the better it will get and it will be more diversified. Yes, yes, very correct answer. So if you take a look at this GIF, so you would see that if it is not able to recognize, it also provides with an option to what it actually is like. So every time you're using it, it's also getting improved with every use because it is a regular process of using the model and retraining the models. So that is what is keeping the model up to date, improving it with 
a uh, time over and over again just like we as human beings we improve ourselves every day it's every day is a new learning process hello it's yes hello another one group query yes hi vishal hi vivek yes hello yes uh, i have found this uh, picture but not found the object like picture what is result after this sorry i could not get you uh i have taken a picture but not uh, output me yeah so so the smart camera app in some cases does not recognize the object yes you are right so the smart camera app is not a 100% correct model and that's what we will try to understand over here why machine learning works in many cases why it does not work so if in some cases it does not work it means that you try to capture an object which the smart camera app is not able to recognize so yes it recognizes only some of the objects not all of the objects so proceed yes if one query another is please so this is machine learning the object find the object by picture yes 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 I, i am right yes you are right okay thanks yeah sure let's try to play another game i suppose this is a game that some of you may have played if not then this is definitely a fun game uh for folks who have not played then i would recommend you to go to this link which is g.co/quickdraw uh, you can open it on your phone on a desktop ideally on phone because it will require you to do some doodling but uh, the link is g.co/quickdraw uh, which is g.co/quickdraw this is the world's largest publicly available doodling dataset it's really fun to play uh i'll give few seconds for people to play if someone is interested or else we can cover the learnings from it this is a fun enjoyable activity see if you can see um, even for this activity also if you can think of a hypothesis or some idea on how this works internally because we'll we'll take this example and, and the example before this the smart camera app to understand how machine learning actually works because the important thing to understand is the what are the applications of machine learning what are some fun exciting things you can build with machine learning that will then make you more excited to actually learn machine learning given that you know something interesting is possible with it if you directly start off with the theory then you will feel like nah too boring for me to understand if you folks want me to use if you folks want me to speak to speak in hindi you want me to explain in hindi then i will be kar sakta hu so yeah as long as people are comfortable with the language completely all of us uh so yeah so if you take a look at the crowd so um, uh does did anyone play the game quick draw uh where you able to draw something that the website was able to recognize or if someone is too excited they can or do you want to play it on the screen actually i was app writing it sorry i said i have tried playing it but it did not recognize I, okay uh, it is telling me to draw a jacket so let us see okay la 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 i see shoe or t-shirt or sweater i see wishbone nahi pata bhai mujhe se nahi aaya or teapot bye or glove set karo bhai bhai jo jada isme fir se khelta dekho ah ye bhi humse nahi hoga one second in many cases it's able to recognize सीलिंग फैन ये हो जाना चाहिए मेरे से ठीक है ला 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 आई सी सर्कल और फ्राइंग पैन और मस्कीटो और रैबिट ओ आई नो इट्स सीलिंग फैन सो इट रिकॉग्नाइजेस द सीलिंग फैन लेट्स ट्राई इट विद द फेस सो आई ट्राई द आई सी सर्कल और पोटैटो ओ आई नो इट्स फेस ओ माय गॉड इट रिकॉग्नाइज द फेस विद जस्ट वन आई ओके वाओ So if you saw that it was one another, yeah tell me hello one other one another question is hello yes 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 one the question is uh, google lens and uh, amazon search is the example of machine learning right uh you said google search is an example of machine learning google lens and uh, amazon search as you put up Yes. Examples yes, of yes. machine learning, right? Yes. They use machine learning. They use machine learning. Yes. How does it work? Can you illustrate me? 
So, okay. Uh, we will try to cover some part of at least how Google search works towards the end of the session. So wait for that. So we will be covering that. The way how Google Lens works, the way how Google Lens works, uh, yes, is yes, thank you. and the way how Google Lens works is very similar to how you saw the smart camera app because the smart camera app is, I would say, a mini version of how Google Lens works. So part of it is image recognition. So if you take a look at this session, like this one second brings us to the same questions, which is how does the game work? How is it recognizing your drawings? And how could we program this? So once again, we are in the same question. Again, how does the game work? So uh, this is a separate link you can take a look at, which is g.co slash quick draw data. This is a large amount of data that is, this is an example of, this is a small exam, example of the total amount of data that the system has for the object carrot. Okay. This is just for the object carrot. This is not even the full data set. So there is large amount of data used to teach this game how to recognize images. So if you go to the link, you can see a lot of examples of for an object. In this slide are some of the examples for the carrot. If you were to describe what a carrot was to someone who has never seen a carrot uh, uh, using only these images, that is essentially how machine learning uh, models able to recognize what a carrot is. Okay. So there is no strict formula written that, okay, it has to be triangle shape, it has to be inverted triangle, it, there has to be some leaves on the top, it has to be this much width or this much height, no. It is able to recognize patterns because so if you take a look, I don't know if my mouse is visible, so this is a carrot which has got an inverted triangle and this is something that looks less with sharp edges and more with curved edges. And it's able to recognize all of this as carrots. If you take a look at this, this is also a carrot. And this, which to a large extent to me looks like an ice cream, a cone ice cream, is also a carrot. So these are diff okay. So these are different drawings that people drew when they were told to draw a carrot. Okay. So when the prompt came as carrot, so these are different different drawings that different people drew across the globe when someone was told to draw a carrot. So based on these models, the computer is able to understand. So okay, this is how carrot looks like based on the different patterns that it has. You may already be familiar with traditional programming where you start with the goal, write logical rules and refine through testing it until it works the way you actually want it. Imagine if you try to describe a carrot the way you just described traditional programming rules, such as those on the right side of the slide. This approach would get very, very complicated if you want to account for all the different possible ways one could draw an object. And if you had to do something similar for not just carrot, but all the different types of objects, so writing rules, strict rules one by one, okay, this much has to be the bit, this has to be the shape, this has to be the height, this has to be the color, may work to a large extent, but it becomes really difficult to scale and add features. So that's where machine learning comes into play. Machine learning is an alternative way to building software. It is not the only way to build software. It is an alternative way to build software. Instead of programmers creating the rules, a model is trained with examples rather than trying to define for a computer what a carrot is with strict rules and account for all the possibilities. The computer is given lots of varying examples like you saw in the quick draw data. The key word over here is lots of varying examples because unless the examples are in plenty, good amount of data, you will not have a good machine learning model. The quick draw model is going to be very similar to the handwriting recognition model. So handwriting recognition, quick draw model, they both are very similar to each other. They work on something which is known as the neural network. We will cover the basics of neural network in the next session when we have it. The question that should come to our mind is, machine learning model is only as good as the example. So if you train a machine learning model to understand what a carrot is, it will never understand what an apple is. So the machine learning model's flexibility or understanding is only limited to the amount of example that it has. So as an example, if, uh, a more concrete example would be, let's say during the training of the machine learning model, you trained it with only shapes of carrot, which were drawn as a, a triangle, inverted triangle. So if you only had images similar to this, it would never be able to recognize carrots which are similar to this, which does not have inverted triangles. So that is also one limitation, whereas your model is only as good as the data that it has. The other question that should come to mind is what are some of the problems or some of the tasks in which machine learning is really good at and what are some of the tasks in which machine learning is not so good at and wherein you feel machine learning is not something that will work. 
so let us try to understand or answer these questions i want people to answer so so we have got now two ways to solve problems one is simple rule based where you strictly tell them you do this 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 is the algorithm or uh, the other is machine learning based so if you have to alphabetize a list of songs which is you have got a list of songs you and you want to sort them in alphabetical order which of the two approaches approaches should we follow and why you know must take a try uh, yes i would like based approach uh if a lot of people are interested to speak you can raise your hands i can give them opportunity or else uh, you can just directly speak so ash we have got ash tosh my uh, okay lot of people raise hands so i think i should be calling out names give me few seconds let me call let me open the participants panel okay let's go sequentially so let's go with ash tosh yeah i'm not able to hear you just in case you are speaking Okay, if I heard you correctly, you said rule based. Okay, can you uh, listen me now? Yes, yes, very well, yes. Ah, uh, so yeah, well, I was saying that we can uh, use rules based approach. I think because we can sort any given list of a uh, string or array or integers as uh, without with simple rules based approach. So I think that should be the way to go. Yes, 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 you were right. The um, the key word over there that you said is simple because. we have got very good algorithms that are really good at sorting uh, we exactly know what is to be done and uh, you can keep your hands raised just in case you want to answer the next question we have got a bunch of questions or you can put your hands whatever feels good for you and totally fine so yes you are completely right the rule based approach is the way to go for this because the sorting rules or algorithms are well suited for this task and there are just fixed number of alphabets in english language so once you have written the sorting algorithm it will work for any number of songs you don't have to keep modifying the algorithm so hence rule based approach is easy simpler and works really good so hence rule based approach is the way to go so let's take a look at this so ranking web search results so this is very similar to an earlier question that came like how does google search work so what do you think so is it rule based approach is it machine learning uh anyone wants to take a guess uh, vishal vishal yeah i think uh, hello am i audible yes okay i think machine learning approach would be better since there could be a lot of criteria as to how the rankings are exactly i mean the results are exactly ranked makes sense makes sense um sanket you want to take a guess i think the machine learning approach will be the correct approach for this one okay 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 anyone over here who believes it should be rule based yes 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 Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, so, hello. Would you give your argument? Yes. Yes. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, why do you feel it should be rule based? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. 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 Uh, I am visible. Uh, you are audible. Yes. Yes, audible. Uh, I think Google Lens, Amazon search engine, and Google search and many more search engines are examples of machine learning, right? Yes. Yes. So, some of other example you think uh, to please tell me. Okay, I ask all of those questions which are not directly related to the slide towards the end of the session. My question over here being: Does anyone else, does anyone think that ranking web search results is possible with rule based approach, or like, do you think it should not be? Uh, I think I have. It is possible. Yes. Shwanath Patra, yes. So it is possible. It depends upon our use case. Like uh, okay, okay. If we want personalized results, then we may have a machine learning involved. But rule-based approach is also possible. Okay, okay. So almost all. Okay, I'll answer this. It is stated right now because initially it was based on uh, the amount of uh, US for the website. According to that, it was uh, arranged. But right now, as we are proceeding into the new age, uh, we are using more of machine learning as we are getting more personalized approach these days. And also, the websites also want a personalized personalized approach, so that uh, every person who requires a certain kind of content will be fed first. Okay. Okay. I'll answer all of that. I'll answer. So the answer to this is a little, I think, expected also. Which is ranking web search results is not strictly machine learning. It's not strictly 
tool based. It's a combination of the both. Be it, you take the example of the search on Instagram, Facebook, Google, you name it. All of the search algorithms they have got an external machine learning and external rule based. The reason why it is not completely machine learning based and there is an external rule, I'll give an example. So let us say we all have been in this pandemic for the past almost two, two and a half, uh, two years ago. Not so let us say that someone is searching on Google um, COVID-19 vaccination. No matter who the person is searching for, uh, as the developer of the search engine, I would always want Hello? the give me a few seconds to answer. Hello. Thank you. Yes, Vivek. Thank you, Ankita. Uh, yeah. So, so as machine learning uh, model, uh, as a developer of uh, Google search, I would ideally expect that I always have the first search result as a result that comes from the government or official sources. No matter how many, so even if let's say an external third party website has got more number of views, much faster website, much everything is much better. But at the end of the day, I would always want government sources to come on top of it. So that's one example wherein I want control overrides or strict rules to be handled in some scenarios. Whereas in some scenarios, I always want the top result to come. So let's say someone is asking uh, asking for who is the top celebrity in the United States. So there could be multiple websites giving multiple answers depending on what's the most relevant to my query. It could be answered by a machine learning model. So there are control overrides in places to make sure that just in case you want to have strict results for some scenarios. Uh, that's why we have got a combination of rules based in machine learning. And this is the pattern that is followed in almost all search results that we have. So predicting house prices based on location. I think this is something that uh, if someone has tried out machine learning, would have encountered uh, on Kaggle. Uh, so this is um, Ashtosh, if you want to give it a try. Yeah, so I think predicting house prices based on location can be uh, done using machine learning, I think, because uh, different uh, different locations, uh, we might have a lot of factors that we cannot control over using rules based. So I think machine learning is a better way to get relevant results. Yes, yes, yes. So what you said is completely right. Yes, there is no perfect formula to, to determine how much a home would cost based on its equation. So there, there is no strict mathematical formula and there are a lot of factors that could play a part in this. So hence a machine learning approach is the right way to go. And for folks who ever um, give a shot at Kegel for learning machine learning, predicting house prices are, is one of the problem statement that comes in the very beginner friendly question. Uh, Processing online payments. So processing online payments. Does anyone want to give it a try? Go ahead. Sarah. I think uh, it's a rule based approach because processing payments are always going to follow the same steps. Yes, yes. Anyone thinks it's machine learning? I saw Ashutosh unmuting. If you want to speak, yes, you can. Uh, actually, I was not sure, so I didn't speak. Yeah, sure. So uh, as said earlier by Rohit, yes, processing online payment is pretty straightforward, logical process. There is no magic happening. You have very strict rules. Okay, this account is not going to be So sorry, I'm going to be sorry. Just in case me speaking in Hindi occasionally is a concern, you can stop me. Uh, so that's pretty strict, um, clear rules. So hence it is a rule based approach, but there are some aspects that could use machine learning. So things like fraud detection to know whether a credit card is stolen if some uh, someone is trying to steal extra money or trying to meddle with the website. So all those fraud detection part, which is not directly payment processing, but things related to payment processing can use machine learning based on the user, based on the mouse movements, based on any, anything else that they do. But the, yeah, like uh, many scams have been detected uh, using machine learning algorithms. So if anyone is trying to scam you, the uh, banks have some machine learning model in place to prevent you from getting scammed. Yes, yes, yes. So preventing scams, understanding frauds is something that machine learning can be utilized for. But yeah, the main core functionality of payment processing is strictly rule based. So one of the India's largest payment processor, Razor Pay, like they themselves have said that they have got very limited uses of machine learning and almost everything they do is based on simple rule based. Classifying an object in photo, the moment you see the words like classification, prediction, all of them are machine learning because you do not have a strict rule to predict something, to classify something. So hence this is a machine learning approach because there are too many variables to try and create rules for situations and no two photos are alike. So even 
uh, when photos of famous landmarks, let's say like the Kutum Minar uh, or the, the Puri Temple. So different people can take uh, images of it from different angles, different lighting conditions, different crop, different people in the images. So it all of the images are different and machine learning is going to be really good at this for uh, finding patterns and uh, recognizing them. And if you end up writing a rules, then it will be really difficult. So yes, it is a rule based approach to classify a photo. So as you have seen by now, uh, rule based approaches in this, you clearly define what the rules are. And uh, if there are some changes, you need to improve the rules or the algorithm that you have written. And the machine learning approach, the underlying data set and the pattern of it is what drives the machine learning model. And if you want to improve the machine learning model, it is possible to improve by providing it with new and better data set. So in machine learning model, the improvement happens by providing data set and rule based approach. The improvement happens by actually changing the code. Each has got its own merits and demerits. Um, let us now understand like from having an idea uh, to build something awesome using machine learning to actually building a system. Uh, this is something that is not uh, simple. Okay, so let us try to understand what are some of the aspects that goes from idea to implementation base. There are a few videos that I recommend you to watch together with me and then we can discuss on the same. Suppose you have a great business idea and you've already gone through the effort to frame it as a machine learning problem. What next? How does your idea become a working machine learning solution? The process has three phases, data, modeling, and production. In the data phase, you identify the input data that your machine learning system needs to make successful predictions. Data may come from databases, log files, web pages, and even other machine learning systems. Once you identify data inputs and sources, you use statistical tools to draw insights about the data. The better you know your data, the more useful hypotheses you can make. Data rarely comes in an ideal state. Data needs to be collated, possibly by joining different data sources, and cleaned for the machine learning model to work optimally. Cleaner data results in better predictions. For a machine learning problem, you start with the input data and convert it into features. Features are key properties of the data. For a supervised machine learning problem, you transform the outcome into labels. Labels represent the intended output of the machine learning system. Joining data sources, cleaning the data, and engineering the features and labels takes time. Plan on spending a large portion of your time in the data phase. Modeling phase. Along with the features and labels, you set up the kind of machine learning system needed called the model. Researchers have created all sorts of machine learning models from simple to complex. Some models classify data. Other models predict numeric values. Tools like Google's TensorFlow support many types of machine learning models for various uses. Before a model can make predictions, it needs training, which is like sending the model to school. First, there are lessons to learn from the data. Along the way, there are quizzes to check knowledge and correct any misunderstandings. In the end, there's a final exam. When training the model, you split the data into three sets, training, validation, and test. The training set corresponds to lessons. Here, the model processes data for the first time. It starts to infer patterns in the data to help make predictions. After you've trained the model once, you quiz it using the validation set. Based on how well the model does on the quiz, you may decide to adjust the model settings or hyperparameters, which are like dials and switches for changing the model's behavior and retrain the model again to give it the quiz again. The goal is to iteratively find settings that provide the best model quality on the validation set. When the model meets your success criteria, it's time for the final exam. Feed your model the test set. If the model predicts well, it passes the course and is ready for real use. Once your ML system is ready for the world, it's time to move the system into production. For starters, your system may need integration into a product. You need to figure out what this integration looks like 
and whether your model interacts with users. Models may need retraining on a regular basis with new data to pick up on new patterns or trends. This training could come from new data sets or from interactions with users. The system needs monitoring. This means tracking system outages, errors, data processing volume and speed, and how successfully it predicts results. Machine learning systems also require maintenance. As with any production system, this means fixing bugs, adding features that didn't make it into version one, and the like. Machine learning specific maintenance could include testing other models and settings to see if performance improves. As you may have seen from this, uh, machine learning begins with the needs of the user and the business person. With this in mind, you define an objective so you know how to proceed. So examples could include, um, example problem statements could include things like predict which friend a user is likely to share a photo with, suggest a user some place to it based on the city he or she is at. These goals will help you define what, what the problem you're trying to solve and at the end also understand how successful or how accurate your model is as well. Machine learning models learn from examples so it is essential to find a large source of data that is relevant to your problem. Experts, as you have seen in the video as well, a large portion of the time goes in collecting, cleaning and curating the data because and it's possible that two different people with same amount of data can produce two different models with different various uh, uh, variations in the accuracy. And it's primarily because probably both of them spend different amount of time in cleaning up the data, curating the data, because your model is only as good as how you format and clean up the data. So the raw data that you get is supposed to be cleaned and processed. The arrow pointing back from prediction to data shows that the entire process is iterative. So it's not that you finish the process and then it is done, because as you have seen in the smart camera task also, and also in the quick draw example, that uh, with every time you use the model, it is retraining itself. So it is evaluate and then back to uh, collecting data as well. Because every time you're evaluating something, you're also collecting the data and retraining the model once again. So this is an iterative method which keeps improving your model over every time you use it. When another question is yes. Test and train model, what is? Yeah, so so given that you have got 100 rows of data, okay, 100, 100 rows of data, so you would not use all 100 to actually train the model because uh, you also want to test if your model is working well and good before actually deploying it. So you would reserve some part of your data and not use it for training. So you would train it with the existing remaining data and then use this test data to understand okay if the model is actually trained or not. You don't want to use the entire data set to train the model because if that's the case, then it will be difficult to test if the model is good enough or not. And you want to test the model on data on which it is new for it. If you test it on data that it has already seen, then it is like cheating, for example, cheating. Data. So, so hence we separate out the test data set and the training data set. If not anything, I mean when I said, if not anything that you remember from the session, this is that one video that I want you to remember from the session, which is important aspect of machine learning, whether you are using machine learning in your daily life or whether you are planning to learn or you are just an end user of machine learning product like Google search or if you're just using it. This is one video that I want you to remember, which is the importance of understanding how human bias can impact machine learning. So I'll play it for you. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. Okay, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? 
Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. There's interaction bias, like this recent game where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias, for example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias from tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation because technology should work for everyone. So as you have seen the importance of having diverse data or unbiased data is extremely crucial to working of machine learning models in an unbiased way. And that is part of the reason why the Google team at CrowdSource is extremely uh, motivated to empower machine learning models using CrowdSource. So CrowdSource is a way through which data is collected and used for machine learning. Uh, so it is used for almost all the Google products and for the images section that you see and also some of the contributions some of the contributions are directly open source so that ends up being used for any machine learning model across the globe so it could be university professors it could be any of the machine learning systems so the diverse amount of data sets that you can contribute through the google crowdsource app ends up in making the world's some of the most utilized machine learning models better at recognizing stuff because as it, as an example, if someone is speaking English uh, based out of India, someone is speaking English from Europe, someone is speaking English from, let's say, UK, uh, US, all of them can speak the same sentence in different accents. Uh, so we want machine learning to be able to understand people from across the globe, which is why we want people from across the globe to contribute to machine learning. And one of the ways to contribute back is using the crowdsource app. So I just wanted to call that out so that you understand the impact of your contributions that you made through the crowdsource app. If you want one more example, one of, the, one of the other example is that it was possible through the contributions of just few people. When I say few people, just three to four people contributing to the crowdsource app. They were based out of Mumbai and based on just their contribution, it was possible for Google to release Google Maps in Marathi based on just few people's contribution. Imagine what could be possible if a lot of us start contributing to crowdsource. So yeah, the impact that comes through contribution is huge. Machine learning systems require lots of data to make successful predictions. What happens when that data is sensitive, such as people's names, credit card numbers, or medical histories? Sometimes sensitive data is needed to train a model so it can make accurate predictions. But at the same time, this data must be carefully protected. This is the challenge of machine learning privacy. Let's look at an example. Suppose you create a machine learning model to diagnose illnesses based on a person's symptoms. Someone who reports a stuffy nose and a cough might receive the diagnosis, the common cold. Whereas someone else with the same symptoms plus a high fever might be diagnosed with the flu. Plenty of other factors might influence the diagnosis too. Does the patient have a medical history of similar symptoms? 
Did she recently travel to another country or spend time on a farm with livestock? Are other family members or roommates sick at the same time? To train this model, you could feed it information about thousands of people and their symptoms, medical records, and demographic information. This data includes plenty of personal information that needs to be kept private. In addition, the data sets involved might contain other private information not directly relevant to medical diagnosis, such as patient contact information or the credit card numbers used to pay healthcare providers. What steps should you take to protect user privacy? Step one is to gather and select only the data that your ML system needs to achieve its goal. The less private data you have in the first place, the less you need to protect. This might seem like common sense, but it takes effort. It's easier to copy a whole database than to spend hours removing the parts that you don't need. Step two is to identify any data in your data sets that may be sensitive. For example, people's names, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, government ID numbers, and other personally identifiable information, or PII, should be kept private. Another type of private information is user-generated content, such as email messages, YouTube videos, blog posts, and any other content created by known individuals. Be sure to work with your product counsel to determine which types of information are considered private and how to handle them. You also need to make sure you have permission to use the data and whether the data has other privacy restrictions. Be sure to work with your product counsel here as well. Step three is to protect the private data. You can do this by controlling access to the data and your ML model, or by altering the data so it's not recognizable anymore, or both. Privacy is a critical concern in machine learning. When you maintain privacy, you build trust with users and protect your company's interests. So the two things that I want you to take away, if not anything in the session, is the importance of understanding that when working with machine learning, you may have got access to machine learning data information of the underlying users, uh, which is supposed to be private and you are supposed to handle it with extreme care, understanding what the regional laws are, making sure you the data is not missed. So if you're working, let's say, at a bank, it's possible that you have got access to their KYC numbers, um, their other card details, a lot of stuff are possible. So if your machine learning model does not require access to this information, do not even feed it into the machine learning model. That's point one. Second point is that it's possible that you build a machine learning model and some bias happens. So make sure you always take additional steps or whatever required to remove any bias that could have happened in the process of the machine learning. So A is importance of privacy, B is bias. Um, the laws in India are still a work in progress, but if I take an example of EU, so if there is a company in EU, EU and they want to process the healthcare data, so let's take an example of Apple. So Apple has got Apple Watch, so let's say they have got users in Europe, they want to process the healthcare data, they can process it only within Europe. Essentially, I mean, the data has to be processed in data centers within Europe and not they cannot take it back to California or US. So th that is some of the rules, laws that are there in some of the places across the globe. Within India, we have got laws coming up. It's a work in progress. Is DEPA is the name of the act, Digital Empowerment Protection, Data Empowerment Protection Act. So yes, so make sure that you always follow the rules. You do not misuse the data. And uh, well, yeah. Uh, make sure that bias is reduced to maximum extent. It's easy to look at examples of machine learning and see it as magic. It opens doors to a lot of new possibilities with technology. It already we already considered certain use cases, examples where machine learning was necessary and some use cases. In this example, we'll try to understand various types of problem that machine learning is best suited at and what can ML do. In news articles and discussions, it's common to hear phrases like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning used interchangeably, but there are distinctions between them. Artificial intelligence is defined as any technology which appears to do something smart. This could be anything from programmed software to deep learning models which, hum which mimic human behavior. Machine learning is a subset or a specific kind of artificial intelligence, but rather than using a rule-based approach, the system learns how to do something rather from examples. 
and deep learning is a specific type of machine learning that uses a technique known as neural networks which connects multiple models together we will cover the basis of neural networks in an upcoming session deep learning similar to machine learning learns why examples it is unique because it connects various models or various layers together to build something complex like um, recognizing patterns in videos or image recognition and stuff like that so the thing that you saw like the crowdsource app uh, using the smart camera task or google lens all of them essentially you can say are deep learning models which use neural networks this brings us to a very simplified overview of the history of machine learning mm. okay so for machine learning to so to properly happen we require three things a the algorithm or the underneath maths of machine learning the data to power it and the technology to actually use it and machine learning is possible only when all three are actually available so does anyone want to take a guess so your neural networks or regression or anything else so when do you think was the algorithm for the same discover so the machine learning model that used when do you think was the maths or the algorithm for that discover anyone wants to take a guess can you repeat again like okay the algorithm or the maths of machine learning that we use today uh, when do you think was the maths for it formulated i think it was uh, the basis of it i think after uh, the maths was created then only machine learning work for that was used i think ah, so let's say so let's say we have got neural network it is purely maths based it's purely algebra based uh, not algebra linear algebra based so let's say that you have got machine learning models kab se machine learning sun rahe hum log 10 12 saal se sun rahe honge maximum 10 12 15 20 saal so when do you think the maths for it 2000 ke aas pas ya fir usse pehle you mean the maths for it came around 2000 and then slowly we picked up with the technology for it the the, the surprising answer is that is that the maths for machine learning that we use today is almost hundreds of years old the maths was always available it was not the maths yeah. of yeah. it uh, developed when uh, the difference engine was created by charles babbage yes that was yes so yeah you could we could say even in those times the maths was pretty good at understanding what machine learning can do but what stopped us from actually having machine learning models are two primary things which is big data which is availability of data and second is technology at this point in time um my phone has got ag bram it's possible that i am using an old laptop which has got an ag bram so you can understand the amount of development that has happened we have got immense amount of development that has happened in terms of technology in terms of compute power so that has empowered us to use those maths and power, power something because the maths for machine learning is complex it requires people to do multiple calculations so maths was that but we did not have the computational power to process it and the second is big data a availability of data and b storage at this point uh, you could have 1 tb 2 tb hard disk available at really low price 10 20 years ago it was really difficult to even find a cd drive um, or a dvd that could come cheap people were even worrying ki dvd is too cost so the the cost of storing data has reduced a lot and the technology has improved a lot and that is what has empowered us to use machine learning today at this point in time the maths was always available the technology and the data storage is what has changed in the past let us start to understand few various examples of machine learning problems uh, pro machine learning types not problems machine learning types which could be used to solve problems classification is a common application of machine learning the system determines which class or category an example belongs to the output can be a label and a percentage of confidence For example, if the classification model was trained to identify whether or not an image was of lion or not, it might output yes or no. However, if it was more generic animal classifier, the output could be things like lion, tiger, mammal, mammal, wildlife stuffs. So the moment you have got multiple outputs, multiple parameters, instead of yes and no, it is a classification model. Classification systems depend on threshold set by human developers, so they can adjust the threshold. Uh, so that the system can distinguish between cases where things could be a little unclear so it as an example if you build an email classification so know if it is important not important spam or let's say it is promotion 
it is it would be important for you to fine tune the parameters to understand what emails should be not spam but promotion so understanding the boundary is something which requires fine tune some of the examples of classification models on the crowdsource app are the sentiment evaluation task image label verification so image verification is where you would be shown images with their possible labels and then you have to say whether or not the labels are correct and the third smart camera is also an example of a classification model it is also an image recognition model there are multiple models on the smart camera almost all the machine learning products that you see in the world uh, use various forms of multiple machine learning models together regression systems is an example of regression system regression system outputs a number for an example would be how long will it take me to drive from point a to point b or the likelihood that someone will click on an ad so the moment the output is a number based on the data that's when it is a regression model regression model is kind of like averaging it out or predicting an average regression systems can be as simple as drawing a line that you see on simple average or it could be even complex things like um you can use logarithmic regression or different forms of regression so this is as an example if you see the distance from mumbai to hyderabad it's the two actual routes are 1 hour 10 minutes and 1 hour 10 minutes uh, via flight and uh, via road it's 13 hour 28 minutes and the uh, in regression model based on some parameters has calculated the middle way round which is 13 hours 27 minutes which is also the time it to take if i'm not wrong by train so these are different routes possible ways and the averaging out result is what happens by the use regression model clustering clustering is a way to understand how close a given data is to another data so so let us say you draw the letter 7 okay so different ways in which you draw 7 would are meant to be close together because they are at the end of the day representing same uh in same output which is the number 7 so when you want to understand how closely related the data sets are to each other that's when you use clustering model the semantic similarity task if you use it on the crowdsource app is an example of clustering model it understands how similar two things are sequence prediction so predicting something is what machine learning is always good at so in order to assist users it could be helpful to predict what they might do next this could be prediction of the next keyboard key a user will select a next keyboard word that the user would type or it could be used to suggest replies to an sms or anything so this is an example of sequence prediction an example of sequence prediction could also be um, a video that a user might watch after watching this present video so the sequence prediction can be really used on the crowdsource app on the glide type or the handwriting recognition model so the way that um, handwriting recognition model and glide type works uses sequence prediction you can give it a shot on the crowdsource app is a glide type uh, like uh, the google gboard feature that is used is um, i mean inherited from the glide glide type itself they collected data from that yes 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 answer is yes style transfer is a little different type of machine learning a little complex style transfer or generation involves training a machine learning model of one type of data set and then applying that model to something completely different it could be seen in this example wherein you have taken the features of a turtle and then put it on top of an image to create something which is totally different so one of the really good examples of style transfer is the deep fakes that you see when some example could be a video of barack obama um fake of uh, deep fake video barack obama saying something which is not actually him speaking but someone else speaking mm-hmm. but barack obama's voice is style transferred on top of that video that is an example of style transfer so let us try to go through some examples uh, and uh, try to understand and uh, have some simple question answers so recommending next word in the android sms app based on the words typed uh, so far uh, give me one second let me open ms teams uh, or is okay uh, I got okay. Just see one raised hand at the moment. Okay, I got multiple. Ashtosh, you want to give a try? Although you have asked quite a lot, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think it should be sequence prediction. 
Yes, the answer is sequence prediction. Yes, given the specific sequence of input words, predicting the next word is. I think it is a sequence prediction. Yes, this one has yes. Your answer is right. Yes. So given the input that you get, uh, the output could be predicted using using sequence prediction. The important aspect to remember while using sequence prediction is that the input order is important. So if your output depends on the order of input, then it is a sequence prediction model. So. In the English language, if I take the example, the order in which you um, place the words uh, actually differs the meaning of sentence. So hence, it is a sequence prediction model where the order actually is important. Uh, classifying an email as spam or not spam. Uh, the word uh, is available on the um, question itself. I have told an answer as well, which is classification. So yes, it is a classification. It is a classification problem. Identifying trends amongst a group of people who have brought, who have bought a new music release. Um, Vishal, you want to give it a try? Uh, it, I think it's, it's clustering. Yes, yes, yes. You are very right. Yes, it is a clustering model. Uh, the goal for this problem is less about making prediction about the user, but about understanding the similarities between different users. Who have purchased a music release? So the moment you want to understand trends, the moment you want to understand what is common across a group of people, how how close they are to each other in terms of their features, you would go with a clustering model. So yes, clustering model is the right answer. Yes. Uh, a bot that reads the news and the voices of famous actors. So as I said, the moment you want to translate features from one type of model to the other type, you would go with style transfer. So yes, this is a style transfer, and as I said earlier, uh, some of the famous examples of style transfer models are the deep fakes that you see flowing across the globe. Determining workout activity based on phone movement. Um, Jyot, Aditya, Pauna. Yes. Hello. Determine work workout activity based on phone movement is it depends on the uh, style transfer. Am I right? Style. Style transfer. I want others to also answer. So anyone else wants to give it a shot? Yeah, I also think it should be style transfer. Style. Why do you think it should be style transfer to determine whether uh, someone is working out? What? I think okay. uh, it's not style transfer. Uh, yeah. I think it's sequence prediction. Hmm. Okay. What are you predicting in this? So, uh, like. Um, when the phone movement, it's uh, it's probably taking movement from the data of a gyroscope that's present inside mm. the phone yes, from the sensors. Yes, yes. So, based on that, maybe prediction. So, is it okay if I speak in Hindi? Clustering हो सकता है क्या? मतलब हम data लेते हैं कि कैसा movement हो रहा है और हम कौन से workout activity को closest है वो determine करते हैं. Okay, I'll answer. I'll answer. Um, I think uh, it's uh, might be regression. Okay, so okay, I'll answer this. I'll answer this. Uh, I'll use Hindi in between. Like this. So had okay, had this been just one type of activity that you are trying to figure out in your particular use case, let's say ki tumhara ek project hai, jisme tum bas pata karo ki koi insan chal raha hai, kine, that's that's one activity that you're trying to track. Okay, so in that case, regression is possible, wherein you could have a number between zero and one. So if it is one, it is hundred percent walking. If it is zero, it is hundred percent not walking. If it is fifty, you would be like, I am not so sure. Okay. So if it is just one thing and you want to have a number, then it is regression. The moment you have multiple types of activity that yeah, you could do, it is difficult to do with regression because then you would have to have uh, different values for different numbers. So if you say like zero, zero point one, if output came, then walking is zero point one, zero point two, then it is running. So it becomes difficult. So when you have just one single output, it is regression. So that's the reason why it is not a regression. The reason why it is not sequence prediction is because you are not predicting something that would happen. कोई चल रहा है तो तुमको आगे क्या करेगा वो predict नहीं करना है. तुमको phone का reading मिला है. तुमको उसे पता करना है कि अभी तक उसने जो किया वो क्या था. Not कि आगे क्या करेगा. Make sense? So that's why it is not sequence prediction. Yes, this could be a clustering problem. This could be solved using clustering. Yes, 
but the easiest way to classify this is a simple classification model because you have got data inputs to tumhara walking ke liye ho sakta hai is pattern mein gyroscope ya fir phone ka gps move ho raha hai running mein is pattern mein move ho raha hai tumhara jumping mein is pattern mein move ho raha hai so you have got different data inputs classified for different data outputs so that is one way clustering se bhi ho sakta hai but at this point you are not trying to figure out ki how close is someone's activity to some other activity so that is not what we are trying to figure out the only goal that you have at this point is to understand ki kaun sa workout kar raha hai that's it so hence classification is the simpler and the easy way to go make sense do i make sense anyone has any questions for counter arguments yes sir so but dono se solve ho sakta hai yes yes kaun sa better hai problem but statement but... can be solved using multiple approaches one of the ways to decide which approach is to a the amount of time and data and resource you would spend to train the model and be how efficient or fast it will be when in use sir to aise example de sakte hain koi problem jo exclusively sirf classification se ho sakta hai aur koi ek problem jo exclusively sirf clustering se ho sakta hai clustering ka one of the really good example is a handwriting recognition kyunki handwriting recognition mein tum agar tum koi seven draw kiya hai you are not trying to understand the, it's really easy to understand using clustering because if someone else also draws a seven it would be very similar to the existing seven that is already there one other example of clustering uh, that you would see aage ka i think next the example hai we'll come to that uh, let me see if the next example but yeah there is one really good example of clustering uh, which you will see in the one of the next slides identifying famous landmarks in photo i think this uh, we have covered multiple times it is a classification problem because the moment you have got um, input bahut sara hai and output strict possible outputs hai and you have tumhara labels ho sakta hai like it is like taj mahal like it tower wall of china statue of liberty and then it is a simple classification problem uh suggesting spelling correction yes this is a clustering problem i am getting the answer i'll explain the earlier question that i had come okay so if you, so let us take an example that uh, i am trying to write let us say developer d e v e l o p e r and let us say i wrote it as d e v e l o p ई की जगह मुझे मान लो कि दो बार आर टाइप हो गया तो डी वी एल ओ पी आर आर हो गया ठीक है द रीजन वाई इट इज रियली गुड टू यूज अ क्लस्टिंग मॉडल ओवर हियर इज दैट द स्पेलिंग मिस्टेक्ड वर्ड एंड दी एक्चुअल वर्ड वुल बी रियली क्लोज टू इच अदर इन द क्लस्टिंग मॉडल क्लासिफिकेशन में आसपास नहीं होगा इट इज रियली इजी टू फाइंड आउट कि कौन सा करेक्ट वर्ड फॉर गिवन रॉन्ग टाइप स्पेलिंग यूजिंग क्लस्टिंग मॉडल बिकॉज द क्लोजेस्ट स्पेलिंग वुड बी क्लोज टू द डेटा इन द क्लस्टरिंग मॉडल And this is a good example where clustering is one of the only model that could work really well. Because you want to know which data is the fastest, you can know that. And that's why clustering is very good. Make sense? Yes. 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 Yes
which is uh, it's a regression model and uh, translate and then one second yeah that's about the questions we had to cover some of the recaps so overall we covered what's the basis of machine learning difference between machine learning and rule based idea to implementation various kinds of problems in machine learning like um, sequence prediction and everything else so clustering classification regression style transfer so that's about the basics and intro to machine learning as i said earlier crowdsource by google has got a web and a mobile app and it allows users to answer quick questions which at the end of the day is in a gamified ui and uh, the folks were interested and were super enthusiastic crowdsource has got level program wherein if you level up to if i'm not wrong i think ankita can confirm this for me i think it's level 15 wherein you get invited to google office or it's level 17 if i'm not wrong but yeah so there it's are perks 17 for 17. invitation level 15 is getting certified publicly so yes so there are perks of contributing to crowdsource a you get some perks b you get recognized and at the end of the day all of this is improving the machine learning models that we have out in the world not just limited google technologies because things like the uh, image recognition uh, the images that you contribute all of them are completely open source which are available for people across the globe to use for any of the models that they want to use that's about the basics that we had uh, of the beginners track we would be having the next session where we'll be covering neural networks and uh, see you soon thank you all for attending in case you have got uh, the post uh, workshop uh, i'll come to questions the post workshop form would be provided at the end of second session which would be not taking today but we would be taking it uh, on a future day which angita would be sharing yes uh, you can reach out to me if i am not able to answer questions uh, on any platform but yeah i could answer your questions right now Yeah, so I was asking, what if we use a machine a classification, machine learning problem to predict what type of problem is a given problem, and then use a cross and have a, a, many uh, many models, machine learning models, and uh, one a machine learning model to predict what type of problem is given a problem, and have many models to uh, solve the given problem. What if we do that and have a big project? it's a really really interesting question okay the only the reason why machine learning machine learning scientists and data scientists are paid in, in huge numbers at this point in time is because we we don't have clear data set to predict which type of problem statement could use which type of machine learning model strictly that comes with people's experience the moment we have got sufficient data sufficient examples to understand okay this problem is to solve with this machine learning model then we could have a model trained on that the concern that comes with training a model to understand which model to use essentially is the fact that you do not have sufficient data set to train the model and that is why the experience of some of the renowned scientists and experts come really handy because they have experience the moment you have got sufficient data uh, and even across the globe has access to the data then it is possible that we can come to a stage wherein we can have systems which could tell you for a given problem what type of model you should be using yes this would answer your question okay, thank you a good question actually okay i also have one question uh, regarding uh, uh, hello will we be uh, hello yes will we be uh, just one la last question one last question bolo I think Ashutosh, you could continue, and then I'll allow the week yeah. to have his question. Yeah, yeah. Bolo, bolo. Okay. 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 So I was saying that uh, in the next uh, next uh, session that we will be having, uh, will there be any coding session like uh, on? Okay. How will the, will be? Uh, yeah. Okay. Good question. The next session we will not be having coding, but we will be tinkering around with uh, an online machine learning uh, playground. but it does not require you to code anything using it on laptop is recommended uh, to actually play around with it if uh, your university hosts the intermediate workshop this is a beginner stack the intermediate workshop which is a three session workshop that involves actually coding on tensorflow and cola but the next session does not involve coding okay okay thank you
And yes, do they kick in now ask your question? The code, the uh, code programming language, the uh, used in machine learning. Understand? Nee. Used in machine learning. So, first, what do you say? Main programming languages. Okay, so you can do. Okay, the maths and the concepts are same. You can do machine learning in almost any language that you want. Some of the languages that are used a lot are R and Python. People also use TensorFlow in, uh, with JS. So, you can do machine learning in any language you want because the core functionality, the core mathematics of it. Is the same irrespective of the language you use. The reason why people use Python or R is because it's really simple to script. Uh, but yeah, there is no strict boundary. You can use any language you want. You can use Go, JavaScript, Java. To be frank, in language you want. Uh, so I ha I had a question like uh, okay, I have you. this like common doubt like what like the, uh, how to differentiate a problem into classification and uh, clustering like. Let us say I have uh, so many images, and I want to know like uh, which one is closer, which one is a lion, and which one is a horse or something like that. Like so, what should we say? Like uh, uh, we should uh, should we call it we are classifying images as lions uh, or horses, or we are clustering them uh, as their closeness to a lion or a horse? Okay. The problem. Okay. Image is a complicated data set. Very frankly, image is a, you take images of lions and horses. It's a very complicated data set, and it's really difficult to cluster them together. Very frankly, okay. And hence, I would recommend you to go with the classification approach. But your your thought process is right, wherein it's possible that you get confused between whether I should go with the clustering route, whether you're clustering the lions together, or you should go the classification route. You should go with the classification route because creating clusters uh, with images is not easy. And classification model, if it solves a problem statement, you should go with the classification problem statement. Uh, so another thing, like in classification, we have to earlier label the data. Yes, yes, yes. So I am telling them that uh, this is a like. Let us say we have three kinds of uh, lions or tigers. Or, like let us say three kinds of animals, hmm. and we train it. Uh, uh, we we. train it with that data mm -hmm. can we make an uh, like uh, model that can distinguish uh, if we give a fourth type of animal say that it is none of them usually no. usually no usually the answer is no but uh, some of the ways to escape the problem statement is that so let us say that uh you have trained a model to recognize let's say cats and dogs okay and you input a lion tick so what you could have is that the the other argument that you get as output to any machine learning evaluation is the confidence percentage so if your model says that it is a cat with 60% confidence you can assume that maybe it is not telling the right answer so you could have a limit on the confidence interval beyond which only you would accept the right answers and be, below that you can assume it is not recognized properly but yeah usually the computer directly cannot tell you that it is none of this okay thank you thank you for this session thanks angita thanks for this thanks everyone thanks just, for joining uh, yeah. just a quick reminder to everyone out here if you are still have questions you can make like you can ask us so that we can reach out and make it possible for Like you know, connecting you with Apple, or um, if you still have questions, maybe you can store it somewhere for the next session. Um, I'd stop the recording now, but I'd request all of you to stay back just for one more minute so that we can have a group picture. If it's okay with everyone out here.